welcome to Mythmakers. Mythmakers is the podcast for fantasy fans and fantasy creatives brought to you by the Oxford Centre for Fantasy. My name is Julia Golding. I'm an author and screenwriter and I also run the centre. And I'm joined today with my frequent podcast partner, Jacob Renica, who is based over in Seattle. Uh, he works in the game making industry, as in board games, uh, Ravensburger, but he is also an expert on all things Tolkien. Uh, so, Jacob, we are in the Oscar season, and I was thinking about the relationship between awards and fantasy films because it's often said that fantasy is one of those genres which is not rewarded by those who hand out the oscars do you think this bears out when you actually look at the list of films that have been winners do you think that's that thesis is correct yeah i i think so and it's the the purpose that yeah, the the question is who who's doing the voting what's their expectations when watching a film um, and those are very specific. And certainly the slant is toward films that are more uh, serious, uh, that are tackling big questions, and especially that have um, you know, actors that are tortured in some way, uh, some variety of ways, right? Those are the ones that they're looking for, like the type of performances that they get. Um, so, yeah, so I think it, it bears out in, in some sense as a closer that fantasy and fantasy adjacent films get to touching on serious uh and meaningful subject matter and actors who have some sort of sense of <laughs> tortured myth in their uh in their role uh that's where we get uh, some of the you know fantasy films directing acting happening um but it, it visually is different right the directing and visuals that's kind of like a separate one but we're talking about like major films like best picture yeah I, best I actors think, yeah i think we should restrict ourselves to talking about the acting awards and the best picture awards because when you actually dig down obviously uh, we don't even need to talk about special effects because they're very often it's they they sweep the balls yeah, films. yeah yeah uh, and also i was checking through the animated feature films uh, mm -hmm. i mean of course, most cartoons are fan just because you can draw right. cool things. But actually, purely fantasy, things like Spirited Away, wonderful films have won uh, the Oscar for Best Animated Feature. And just, just go and check this, what's a wonderful Disney product. You know, just really good film. Yeah. Um, so let's put those to one side. What is lacking in the Best Picture winners? And I was thinking this because I went and had a look in the foyer of the Dolby Theatre back in January, and they list the best picture for each year. There is no um, no smash hit there for the fantasy. There's no Marvel film, for example. Um, and there is a strange choice of those which I would say fall slightly uneasily under fantasy films, um, with one exception. So The Shape of Water, if you remember that rather odd film, that is obviously a fantasy of sorts, but it's very offbeat, very weird. Um, right. Birdman, that's a mixture of fantasy imagination and a sort of, though you could say it's within the world of the actor um, who's in Right. So it's, I, that's what I'm saying, it doesn't fit quite. Um, mm -hmm. Last year's winner, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, is a kind of sci-fi high concept. Uh, right. But yeah, I suppose you could say that's fantasy. A as border well. on fantasy, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So maybe, fiction. maybe when then they do uh, have that element in them, it doesn't stop them winning. But they, with the only absolute mainstream, total yes, that's a fantasy film is obviously Return of the King, which won the Oscar in two thousand and four, I think it was. Um, and yeah, well, everybody agrees that's a fantasy film. Whereas the others you might describe more as a hybrid of other sorts of genres. But yeah, let's flip over to the performances and there you really do come up against a problem of them not rewarding performances in a, in a fantasy film. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, yeah. And that's, that's to be expected. And, and with these, I think you're right on with the, 
like blending of genres makes it more palatable. But that if it's a heavily if it's a genre piece that's heavy fantasy or sci-fi, or even to be fair, like you said, you know, like uh, an action film, uh, if it's kind of a big budget blockbuster action film, comedies, um, westerns, even um, well, what westerns more so because I think they can get to more of that serious slash, you know, meaningful and tortured performances. Um, but a lot of those kind of like big budget mass audience films, those aren't the ones that are being considered here or rewarded. So for the actors, it's the same thing. So that's, it's, it's really interesting with the actors um, uh, in, in this most recent uh, Oscar uh, round uh, coming up that Barbie, which is a fantasy fantasy film hmm. uh, is, has, uh, you know, nominations for best picture uh, and, and two supporting actors and adapted screenplay, but not for best director or best actor. So Margot Robbie does not even get a nomination, even though the film is nominated and the supporting actors uh, It's really fascinating looking at those, the supporting actors, right? Ryan Gosling and America Ferreira as kind of like more tortured. It, yes, it is Barbie's story, but if you look at what the characters yeah. themselves are, are 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 having to wrestle with more intensively, and the it's the what they're in in that degree of supporting actor, not in the primary actor. It's it's really interesting on how yeah, so how, how Margot Robbie in the main character for the film would not be nominated, but it's the same film and the same storyline, but the the two supporting actors for that uh, from that fantasy film are nominated. So it, it, there's a, a really interesting, I think that that's a good demonstration of, of what is because like Margot Robbie's character is Barbie most of the way through, right? It's kind of a, her performance is yeah. fairly even and level. Whereas the other two are characters that are kind of like yanked from their world and you see them wrestling, at least in, in how they're, it is more intensively. And because as I think perhaps less screen time on them you can see the wrestle a little bit more it's kind of more a, intense than over the entire film but they have a better song <laughs> yeah, right <laughs> exactly exactly the song doesn't that doesn't hurt but yeah so the so the the individuals um and performances yeah so we have like with lord of the rings in particular with as many academy awards as it did receive including you know best picture best director best screenplay for you know, return of the king the only actor nomination uh, or reward award that you got was for Ian McKellen just from fellowship of the ring mm. um, was the only one that was won there. So it's interesting looking at, yeah, the different characters there and there's, yeah, it's, it's so, hard to sorry, say, but that's did, just an interesting Ian, trend. So did Ian McKellen, sorry, did he win something for it or was he just nominated? I don't, I thought he was, I didn't think any of them got an acting award. He didn't. He didn't get an award, but it was it was a nomination. So oh, Adam, okay. he was the only one that was nominated, uh, okay. didn't win. But that was even the only nomination across all three films was just Ian McKellen for the for Fellowship of the Ring. Oh, I, I, I'd forgotten that. Um, I'm just looking through the list of people uh, of men who won the acting role. I need to p- pull up the women because I'm having them back in my mind that maybe Michelle Yeoh won one for Everything Everywhere All at Once. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, a woman winning, winning a main, if we allow that to be a fantasy. Of course, Joachim Phoenix won for being. Yeah, Joaquin Joker. Phoenix. And, and that's exactly and what you Heath say. It's the, it's the. Tortured. <laughs> it's yeah. got to be tortured. Right. Torture your character. Right. And, and, and the only, and I'd say like, even for like, the like big budget or an even, yeah, big budget Joker versus Dark Knight. So you have two, the only, I would say, you know, like the two best actor roles in a fa- fantasy type or a fantasy edition film. You have Heath Ledger for the Joker and Joaquin Phoenix for, Phoenix for the Joker, both of which performances are these, again, like t- tortured individuals that are vacillating between two different worlds. And so, but, but it's, 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 it's really interesting that it's the same character that is winning both of those roles, even though it's different franchises, it's within the same story world of batman um that that's where you get these but batman is never nominated <laughs> for or is, is does never get this award for and i don't even think nominated for best actor um whereas the villain the more kind of emotionally complicated and <laughs> tor- tortured he to keep going back to that word but yeah so that's that's kind of a anomaly in the uh best actor 
uh, wins. Yeah, because I was thinking that um, Harry Potter was didn't didn't get in the running for any of these, and I was just thinking about the performances, particularly in the later films and in the very last one, which in a way is a war movie. Mm. And I do think that Daniel Radcliffe actually acts incredibly well. I mean, he's turned mm. out to be such a smashing actor. Um, you know, he's learned he learned in front of us all, didn't he? You know. Um, and I think that when he actually goes at the end to offer up his life in a way is incredibly moving and is like some kind of war film sacrifice. But nobody ever said, oh, well, maybe Daniel, after having done seven, how many films was it? Seven or eight films? Uh, maybe he should be given a nomination at least. Nobody, I don't remember that being uh, no. because he's a wizard, no. Harry. <laughs> right yeah yeah there's somehow you're in a different role yeah and it's oh, snape. Interesting. you know snape being the sort of yeah yeah um, see that one's one that i think would come probably closest to actually happening because of the, everyone loving uh, alan rickman and thinking he just alan rickman things. right so if you look at and then i think to, to just emphasize this point even more looking at james cameron films right so james cameron recognized as you know one of the most influential filmmakers uh, of the past, you know, three decades, um, you have for Titanic, he does a show on, you know, a, a film about a historical event, period piece wins 11, you know, 11 Oscars, uh, for Titanic, but, and, and including two best and best and best actor, um, for, uh, in that film. Um, but for the, his other films, right. For the, you know, Alien, The Abyss, Terminator, Avatar, you only get one acting nomination. That's for Sigourney Weaver um, in there. But it's just, even though the, these films are recognized as being groundbreaking and important and significant visually um, and, and directed, uh, the actors in those films that received said praise were not nominated, were not even nominated with the exception of Sigourney Weaver. Um, there, so you, you, there is definitely uh, a, is it, a I, I, I would say, I guess bias is an okay word to use, but it's just the the sensibilities on what they're looking for. I don't know if it's the visual, if they're then, if it's put, the film is put into this visual medium rather than the acting medium. But there are those that break through and uh, cross over what we just mentioned with the. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix and Heath Ledger for Joker, that even though those were, but, but, but again, both of those films weren't high fantasy. Uh, no, those were very no. grounded approaches yeah. to the superhero genre. They're very, very grounded with, I don't even think with, especially with, with Joker, that one being kind of devoid of any sort of, you know, technology, any sort of kind of superheroism. It was just kind of more of a character study. Um, whereas the Heath Ledger was set within a clearly superhero genre, but it was a grounded Christopher Nolan's very grounded approach to uh, storytelling in the superhero genre, as opposed to Marvel films, which is a different beast entirely. Yeah, I, I mean, looking, I, I, it's, we obviously need to uh, look at other award. To I'm looking at the Oscars here, but looking at the. Um, acting nods that go very very often more often than not it's for somebody who's playing somebody from real life so you can tell how good they are at being that person so brendan fraser was p playing that guy the uh, you know the one with the the weight issue uh will smith the year before that was the tennis coach king richard i think it is isn't it that one um rami malek um bohemian rhapsody Obviously, um, uh, Eddie Mercury, um, Gary Oldman, Darkest Hour, that's Winston Churchill, Eddie Redmayne, that's um, Stephen Hawking, I can go on, uh, Lincoln, Daniel Day-Lewis, Colin Firth playing the, the king, <laughs> and so on. So it does seem as though that's an easier... It, it's very hard to judge fantasy performances when you don't know what they're based on. Um, right. Maybe that's part of it that we can tell that our fellow actors have done a really good job because we know what they're trying to get at. Maybe it's just easier. You feel more secure in saying, 
oh, let's vote for Colin Firth, then let's vote for uh, a wizard, you know. Um, I don't know. That might be part of it. But anyway, let's be different from the sort of general Oscar lineup. And let's think about which fantasy performances that have been neglected would we nominate. You can go back as far as you like, but who are the ones who actually, when you think about it in the long view, which we now have, you think actually that really deserved a nod at the time and nobody noticed. Didn't get it. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think, go, again, going part of the farthest back um, would be Seventh Seal. Uh, okay, right. <laughs> yeah, right. So in 1957, <laughs> right. So yeah, so so that's one. So this incredibly film is, you know, this incredibly acted uh, and it didn't get any, at the time, no Oscar nominations whatsoever. So that's one that's kind of people have returned to time and again for being uh, you know, an incredibly influential uh, piece of cinematography and you know, storytelling and, and acting. So that's one going again way, way back. Um, I know we didn't have acting nominations uh, from uh, Wizard of Oz uh, with Judy Garland um, yeah. or anyone else supporting there, right? So that was one that you didn't have um, anything there. Um, I, I am I am happy that Right around the same time, you know, not too terribly long way, Mary Poppins, uh, Julie Andrews won Best Actress uh, for that. So we did have a female in a fantasy film oh. leading there uh, in 64. But uh, yeah, yeah. So those are some of the older generation ones kind of coming up more recently in terms of the like, film and acting. Uh, oh, I need, to, I need to sit one in before we get too modern. Yeah. I think actually in retrospect... Um, Harrison Ford in the very first Star Wars as a best supporting actor because he totally revolution, you know, the that he grounded that film. Right. Everybody else is playing, you know, heroic roles with great right. big stakes and being all very noble. And he's the there as the the hustler, the the guy who <laughs> right. kind of made it feel real. Uh, right, and fun. right. Um, because you could understand his motives. He wasn't being powered until, of course, he pull, comes through. You know, that's the, his his arc. His arc is very pleasing. So there's all sorts of things about that performance, which I think really set up the whole Star Wars thing right from the start. So I'd give him a Best Supporting Actor nod, if not the prize, because I don't know what else was around that year, but it'd be right. nice to see well, that and, recognized. And, and you do have uh, Alec Guinness as Ben Kenobi, as Obi-Wan oh, yes. Kenobi is there. Um, that who actually gets a uh, nomination for support best supporting actor for Star Wars? Oh, uh, does he? Know, oh, right? excellent! Yeah, so you get the nomination there. Right? So then, so and again, that part. So that that character, right? So like Han Solo as being kind of like an archetypal character that brought so much to that role and and pivotal in that role. I think being as successful and appealing to as many people as did. But but Obi Wan Kenobi again, this character who's torn between trying to be you know a, a hermit or you know a hermit. Uh, removing himself from the larger stage of intergalactic interplanetary conflict, who then is forced to come out of that and then ultimately sacrifices his own life. Um, so that, that, that range of performance and you know, the caliber of actor that he was. Um, and yeah, he had class, <laughs> didn't he? <laughs> yeah, right, right. So, so he's doing, he's approaching that film with those sensibilities and not seeing it mm -hmm. as necessarily like a genre piece, um, but that he's, bringing the gravitas of a Shakespearean actor, which is what Ian McKellen did for Gandalf, uh, yeah. likewise, right? And Patrick, Stewart. and Patrick Stewart and does that for the ones he's in as well. Exactly, exactly. So I think that's what, yeah. So so there, so I think, so I'm, I'm glad that justice was done to at least Obi-Wan Kenobi, but I would well, likewise would, would love to see. That. Thank you for, because I, I hadn't remembered that. So, okay, let's go a bit more um, up to date. I mean, the world wasn't ready for it, but in retrospect, Gollum Andy slash Andy Circus should have got mm. best supporting actor. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Return of the King or Two Towers? I'm not. I'm not fast. Which one they pick? Probably Two Towers actually, because it's more more screen time. Yeah. Um, and wouldn't it have been fun to see Andy Circus go up with the like lead animator? Uh, and, <laughs> right. and accept the award in the voice of Gollum. I mean, that, it just should have happened. 
Right. Yeah. Or the tuxedo with little dots on it. Uh, <laughs> motion capture dots on the tuxedo itself. Yeah. Um, no, that would, that, I think, yeah, ab- absolutely. And that's one that I think now there's more openness to that actually being considered acting. And that's what, mm-hmm. if you read the, the, the book that we actually referenced in another episode on uh, New Zealand, there's a book that, uh, the, um, anything you can imagine, uh, Peter Jackson, the making of middle earth by, uh, Ian Nathan, uh, mm-hmm. talks about that and the, the complexities of dealing with an actor being seen from the Academy and people evaluating, is this a cartoon? How are you evaluating this? Because it's not the person themselves on screen, but it's a motion capture of the person. So there's a whole kind of unexplored area between what is a performance and what's considered and eligible to be considered for Mm -hmm. an award in a performance. So I absolutely agreed there. Um, I would highlight just a little bit before that, um, say Groundhog Day, with Bill Murray, 1993. So this is a fantasy film, a time loop, one of the first like- Yeah, fantastic film, yeah. Right, and he is an actor beginning because of the comedy, uh, kind of a situational, high concept situational comedy. The high concept might fly, but because it's a comedy that almost like removes the consideration because it's comedic, but uh, but the the arc that he goes through in that film, as a character and the, you know, kind of like the philosophical turn that he makes, uh, is, is fantastic. Um, I appreciate that, but other ones, I think one, again, like more, more recently, um, uh, a monster calls. Did you ever see that one? So 2016, uh, monster calls film adaptation of the book. Um, it's Shivan uh, Proud and Patrick Ness collaborating because Shivan yeah. Proud died. Exactly. Yeah. So that one, that, that one is, I, I, I saw it in the theater and was actually able to see it kind of as an advanced screening of that one. And cause I love the book so much. And it's one of the books that I give to people is monster calls uh, most frequently that I gift to other people uh, because the combination of the written word and the art uh, that's in there um, uh, with uh, Jim K um, who does the art, who also does the art for the uh, illustrated uh, Harry Potter uh, edition. Oh uh, yeah, uh, that yeah. come out. So you know, monster calls. So just like the powerful interplay between the the word um, and art. But so what they did there, story wise, incredibly moving story. Um, but translating that into film, um, uh, Patrick Ness did the screenplay for that as well. And so it captures the same sensibilities and as an adaptation into a different medium, he adds something visually and character wise that you don't have in the books that really layer the performance. Uh, and the story itself and made it kind of a different creature. Um, but like the performances there, uh, Felicity Jones, an incredible performance as a, you know, young mother dying of cancer, uh, and the, the, um, her child, um, is, I can't remember the name of the actor, but he just gave a stunning performance. And I, I don't know what the youngest actor that's been nominated <laughs> for, uh, a, in one of these awards are, but we have had some, you know, instances. Uh, oh, the one in the piano very was very young, wasn't she? Um, yes, 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 yes. But it's, it's, it's a rarity, but you have some, and especially now today, child actors are so good mm-hmm. uh, that, yeah, so that, that's one that I would like to see um, uh, Patrick or uh, Connor O'Malley, the character's name in Monster Calls, the, the child, um, he was phenomenal. And so see either Felicity Jones or, uh, or him in a monster call would be wonderful. Or even being considered for best picture, just visual J. Uh, uh, Boyena who did, who actually, so he was the director, uh, who also directed the first two episodes of rings of power. Oh, okay. So that kind of like artistic sensibility that he brought to that, um, cinematically is what's on, on display there in the monster call. So yeah, I did not know that connection. So, um, thank you. That that's taught me something there. So, um, I was wondering going on your, it has to be a tortured performance. I did wonder about the film Logan because it had Patrick Stewart yeah. and, um, yeah. And in it, plus also that young actress, Daphne, she's got an unusual name. Uh, Keen. Is that her name? Anyway, um, she's so the three of them all give very nuanced, proper acting 
<laughs> proper acting performances. And I don't, yeah, I think that was one that could have got the nod at some point. Yeah. Yeah. With, with Hugh and huge, Hugh Jackman's performance in that is, and, and even Patrick Stewart for supporting when he's yeah. uh, there in the film, Bo both of those. Yeah. Are again, like that's another one of these superhero genre, but I, I would put that in the same class as uh, Joker, yeah, like exactly. Joaquin Phoenix, right? That's really, that's that's very grounded um, and gritty, and just more of a character study than an emphasis on the fantastical world that these characters are in. It really kind of yeah. zeroes in on the character um, and their internal world uh, and internal journey. So, just to round this up, um, I'm going to allow you two picks for films that you think should have been fantasy films from previous eras that should have been in in receipt of the best picture for their year, looking at it in retrospect. Yeah. Um, uh, I wouldn't necessarily agree. If I, if I had to, so yeah, for that, I would... I even think Green Knight... Most recently, a couple of years ago, was another one that was really good. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. The yeah. one with the, the Sagawain retelling. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah, exactly. And so that one, the performance there, yeah. Um, was it Dev Patel? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that was that was truly excellent. So if we're looking at, especially, I think, like, yeah, more recent films and performances, I would have, yeah, I would, as wild... <laughs> didn't happen and might never happen, but I would, yeah, go with Green, Green Knight, Death Battalion, Green Knight, and uh, the actor that Connor O'Malley in uh, Monster Calls. Yeah. So I would go a little bit further back. I was thinking of between E.T. and Close Encounters, mm. that both of those are actually quite artistic films when you actually look at them now. Maybe E.T., because um, it also had the popularity thing behind it, but it said some, some very profound things. And also the performances of the children, again, were wonderful in that. Yes, incredible. Uh, yes. I watched it yeah. as a child, so I I wasn't analysing it then, but looking at it now, it's it hasn't aged particularly badly at all. It's still got a lot of um, legs to it, that one. Um, so, yeah, that would, have, that would have pleased me if that had won a Best Picture. And I think more recently, well, I don't know. Uh, they should give... Um, if going back to my Harry Potter point, it'd be quite nice if they gave a well done having made all those films award because they were very influential films. I don't know that all of them, each one was particularly perfect, but perhaps the one that should have won one was the third one. Yes. Um, the uh, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban because it upped the game, the clever use of the time turner, the sensibility of it, the Gary Oldman. He doesn't think his performance that was great, but I think it was. Um, and it also the children, young people by that stage were getting into their stride as actors. Right. So yeah. I actually thought that was a pretty good film and very well, recent. And the director, yeah, when then that one in particular, it sounds like that's Alfonso uh, Cuaron, uh, who did, who directed that one, uh, who has gone on to direct yeah. a number of other, like even, um, uh, yes, Oscar winning best pictures. So the filmmaker that they brought on tonally, it's different, right? Yeah. Um, from uh, Chris, Chris Columbus, Columbus yeah. uh, right. From, um, from the earlier, from the first two films, it's very tonally, very distinct and you know what he was getting there, but Alfonso Cuaron brought a different sensibility to that. Yeah. And so it is a little, and granted, like in the story, it does kind of move a little bit dark because you're following the kids and it makes sense where you're starting out with having this director and this kind of tone and feel for the film because they're kids and they're entering into this wonderful world that's slowly becoming complicated, but then now, you're really fully moving into um, more significant plot complications as well as age-wise, these kids are aging up and teenagers, the sort of complicated uh, emotions that they're learning to have to navigate for the first time uh, is, I think, a, an excellent pairing of director that has kind of a different vision and the acting uh, performances themselves. So uh, absolutely yeah. agree there. I mean, I kind of also wanted to say Iron Man as well, but anyway, I've gone with... Um... <laughs> I've gone with Harry Potter. Why not? You know, yeah. Um, but there, there is an argument to be made for the first Iron Man, which I think is a really good film. 
very yeah, good no, I, I, Robert. Anyway, I mean, we could go on, couldn't we? We better, <laughs> we better yeah. draw a line there. And if you're listening and you think we've missed a really obvious thing that we should have said, mm-hmm. and we haven't even mentioned the Hunger Games or any of those other dystopian spin-offs, we ran out of time. Um, let us know. But in our fantasy tip, Jacob, which of these films would you send people scurrying off to see if they haven't seen it yet? I would, I mean, I've, I've talked a lot about a monster calls. I would, I would absolutely recommend that film for an, and, and especially for this audience for fantasy, uh, creatives, uh, and fans, um, that the film itself, uh, the visuals are stunning. You have different, um, Liam Meeson does the voice of, uh, of the monster, uh, and so the, I, I'm a big fan of Liam Neeson's voice. If you liked uh, Aslan's voice in Chronicles of Narnia films, it's the same, same voice. Uh, if you like Jedi Masters, it's the same voice. Um, but just like, so the, the CGI is, is great. So just like the, the sensibilities are brought there, but then you also have, it's a story about telling stories and the stories we tell ourselves and how stories unexpected, how, how stories uh, aren't might not be what they seem and how they can help pull us through difficult times. And so they have within the film, there's a few short animated sequences um, to the, the premise of, you know, this, the story is monster comes to this child who's struggling with a parent um, who has cancer and he tells him three stories. Uh, and these three stories, um, powerful in themselves and interesting and, and playing with expectations. Um, but in the film uh, adaptation, the, they, these are these stories are presented as animated sequences that have these you know beautiful colorful um not too dissimilar from the um uh the deathly hallows animated you know kind of segment yeah. in uh, the, the harry shadow potter puppetry um, thing. right mm. films right yeah so this isn't quite shadow puppetry it's animated but not like a fully you know rendered um uh, it's kind of softer kind of you know um impressionist uh kind of approach to that but storytelling of two different types within the same story about the stories we tell and how they impact us and can help us through uh, the most difficult uh, times that we have in our life. Uh, That that would be my absolute recommendation. If you haven't seen a monster calls um, uh, 2016, um, please go see it. Do yourself a favor and go see that and bring a box of tissues probably (laughs) with it. Uh, It's not a light popcorn fair. Uh, It's, it's definitely one that, that will that will stick with you. Yeah, so I, I might go just to sort of contrast with that. I might go um, into like sci-fi because we haven't we haven't really spent much time. I know people say um, two thousand and one Space Odyssey is is like the most amazing film. I never actually particularly liked that film, so I'm not going to recommend it. I think you have to watch it if you're a film buff, buff just to say you've watched it. But actually, I'm, I'm sort of torn between two, um, three. <laughs> so I'm going Star Trek because Star Trek occasionally produces something really, really interesting. So Star Trek First Contact um, is one of the Patrick Stewart ones, has some really interesting right. questions in it about artificial intelligence and the nature of feeling and the nature of being human uh, is well acted. A lot of Patrick Stewart, who I think is a great actor, but a great supporting cast. So that's my favourite of the Star Trek films. Until the reboot, because the other one I was going to say is Star Trek 1 reboot with Chris Pine, is great. Just such a good film about how to do interesting science fiction, keeping the focus on relationships and not spectacle. Um, I kind of get a bit lost sometimes in the Star Wars films when they go in for sort of lots of starscapes. I, I prefer the Star Trek relationship emphasis. But it's always got to be, when I come down to it, it's always got to be Galaxy Quest. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, to bring Rick and Rickman back into it. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, got to be. Yeah. Which is, I've said it before, I'll keep on saying it until the whole world has watched Gra- Galaxy Quest and laughed. <laughs> Because that is such, it's got Scorny Weaver, it's got Alan Rickman. Oscar nominee. Yeah. (laughs) And it's just such a fabulous, um, well-constructed, hilarious film. And it's the one which I I won't tire of re-watching. 
And it's, it is obviously a fantasy film, but it also has fun of fantasy. It makes fun of fantasy. So yeah, it's, it's self, it's certainly self-aware. Yeah. So if ever you want to cheer yourself up and think, oh, I fancy something which is funny, but also fantasy, that is a good one to go for. Um, right. Well, J- Jacob, thank you very much for um, talking this through with me and good luck to everybody at the Oscars. Thanks for listening to MythMakers Podcast, brought to you by the Oxford Centre for Fantasy. Visit OxfordCentreForFantasy.org to join in the fun. Find out about our online courses, in-person stays in Oxford, plus visit our shop for great gifts. Tell a friend and subscribe wherever you find your favourite podcasts worldwide. <laughs>